Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper and today we're going to have a look at this amazing sculptural group known as the Laocoon group that today you can see in the Vatican museums in the Vatican, which are of course in Rome. Now, I say Laocoon, but we've been having a bit of a discussion about it at home because my wife says Laocoon. We went to different schools, so we were taught differently. So maybe you can tell me in the comments who's right, me for saying Laocoon or my wife for saying Laocoon, or are we perhaps both wrong? I'd love to hear from you. Now, there's a lot to say about this sculptural group. There's the story that it tells, that is what it portrays, and there's, of course, its own history of when and where it was made and how it was found and restored. And I'll start out with the story we see played out in front of us right here. As you might have gathered from the title of the work of the Laocoon group, there's a central figure here and his name is Laocoon. He was a priest in Troy and he warned against that trick of the Greek to get into the city using that horse that we all know about. He was the one to say, I don't trust the Greek even if they come bearing gifts. This was at the end of the Trojan War or at that moment that's what the Trojans thought. And it's this epic war that probably, and I think hopefully, never actually took place. I'm sure you've heard about it at some point, but let me do a very quick recap. There once was the most beautiful woman in history. Her name was Helena. And she was so beautiful that all the kings of Greece wanted to marry her. But to avoid anyone starting a war over her, they made a pact. She was to choose her husband and all the other kings of Greece swore to defend their happiness. She chose to marry Menelaus, the king of Sparta. Now, on the other hand, there was this Trojan prince named Paris, who was forced to sit in judgment over the beauty of three goddesses. He was bribed by all three, but Aphrodite, or Venus, bribed him with the best gift, which was the love of the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, when Paris, along with this delegation from Troy, visited Sparta, he cashed in that prize and won the heart of Helena. He abducted her and took her to Troy. And that is why not just Sparta, but all the Greek cities were now at war with Troy. According to the story, they launched a thousand ships to attack the city. And the war lasted for 10 years. And many an epic poem was written about it, most of which are lost to us. Only two remain, more or less complete, and those are the Iliad and the Odyssey. But they don't really tell us anything about the scene that we see here. You see, the Iliad is only about the troubles between Achilles the greatest warrior of the Greek, and Agamemnon, the overall commander of the Greek forces. And it mainly tells us about how he didn't want to fight because he was slighted by the commander. And all of that took place after 10 years of warfare or siege, and it may surprise you that in the entire Iliad the Trojan horse is never mentioned, because that happened after the Iliad ended, which is to say after Achilles died. You see, Achilles never set foot in Troy, he died outside of it. I know, quite different from the movie. Then the Odyssey is simply about Odysseus trying to get back home and all the sort of troubles and adventures that he has along the way. There they do talk about the horse once or twice as a sort of memory, but the details of the Trojan horse story are from different books. By the way, all these events of the Trojan War are made much worse by the fact that the gods are all invested in these things. They're all fighting their own war through humans and the humans fight and die for it. For instance, Helena was a half-god, a daughter of Zeus, just as, for instance, Achilles, his mother was, well, not a goddess, but a Nereid, which is a daughter of one of the oldest gods of the sea, called Neras. And to give you some examples of how much the gods were invested, Apollo himself had once been punished for his insolence and had to help build the walls of Troy, which is why they were impregnable. And indeed, in the entire war, they are not breached. But Athena and Apollo were on opposite factions of the gods. Athena wanted Troy to fall and she gave the idea of the Trojan horse to Odysseus. And of course the trick of the horse was that the Greek built a big wooden horse and then they got on their ships and left. One man was left behind and his name was Sinon. He was Greek and claimed he was a deserter, but in fact he was left by the Greek to make the horse look more attractive than it would otherwise be. For instance, he told them that they made it too big to fit through the Trojan gates on purpose so that they couldn't take it within the city. And that made it all the more attractive for the Trojans to try that anyway. And they had to tilt it to get it in. Now, of course, we all know that there were soldiers hidden inside and as night fell, they would get out and open the gates and the Greeks 
army would then have quietly returned and would run into the city and burn it. But before that happened, there were two people in Troy that warned against taking the horse inside the city. One was Cassandra. She was a princess, daughter of the king, and had promised her love to Apollo in return for the gift of seeing the future. But after she had gotten her gift, she went back on her word and refused Apollo. Now, this is not a thing you should do to gods, because trying to outsmart a god tends to backfire badly. You see, Apollo couldn't take back a divine power once he had given it. But he could ruin her life anyway. So he just gave her another gift, which was a curse really. And that was that no one would ever believe her. So she was gifted with the sight of the future and cursed with the fact that no one would ever believe her prophecies. And the other person in Troy to warn of the horse was Laocoon. He was a priest of Apollo and Poseidon, and may or may not have been told by Apollo that there was something wrong with the horse, and he begged the Trojans to simply set fire to it. He even flung a spear at it, but Athena got in the way, and she shook the ground around him so hard that well, first he missed and then he turned blind. Later he tried to make a sacrifice to either Apollo or Poseidon when sea snakes came from the sea and strangled him and his sons. And the story never makes it clear who sent the snakes. It could have been Athena to further punish him, or Apollo for not stopping the horse, or to make him pay for a crime he committed earlier, because apparently he had made love to his wife in the temple in view of the image of Apollo. But it could also be Poseidon, because he too was on the side of Troy and Laocoon had failed to stop the horse. But anyway, he and his sons were killed. Now, how do we know this story? As I told you, it's not in the Iliad and it's not in the Odyssey. Well, there are at least five more large epic poems that were written in ancient times, some of which must have been contemporary with the Iliad and the Odyssey. But very little of them remains. We only know of them through references of later writers and a handful of loose verses that still exist. But in much later years, entirely new versions were written of the story, and the most well-known of them was Post-Homerica, which means after Homer, written by Quintus Smyrnaeus, which means Quintus from Smyrna. He was a Greek poet from the 4th century BCE, and he wrote extensively of what happened just after the Iliad ended, so the entire story of the horse and then the burning of Troy. So we know it mostly from him. And then a few centuries later there was Virgil. He was a Roman writer who wrote the Aeneid. That's the epic story of Aeneas, who was a prince of Troy and escaped the burning city. He would eventually make his way to the other side of the Mediterranean, where he founded a city, and he would be a forefather of Romulus and Remus. So in that way, a sort of precursor to the founding of Rome. And we think that these are stories that were already going around, well-known stories to the Romans, but he made them into one epic poem. And again, here, the entire story of Laocoon is told. And so we can assume that to Romans this was a very familiar story, because, of course, it has something to do with their founding story. Now, the sculpture was made for Romans, at least that's what we think it was. And we think this mostly because this is not really a Greek subject. Greek sculpture is generally about Greek heroes or gods, and not so much about their vanquished enemies. So it makes sense that this was made for a Roman audience, which makes it different from many other sculptures found in Rome, because those are always copies of Greek originals. For a long time, there was an entire industry of sculptors working in Greece, copying older works for the Roman market. But as I said, this is different as it seems to have been made directly for a Roman, perhaps as a commission. And we know of it through one classical writer named Pliny the Elder. He described the sculpture in the palace of Titus. Titus was the son of Emperor Vespasian and would succeed him after the death of his father. But at the time that Pliny wrote about the art in the palace of Titus, he was still just the son of the emperor. By the way, Pliny and Vespasian were close friends. That is how he got access to all these palaces. And they died only months apart. Vespasian of a disease, we don't know exactly what, on the 23rd of June of the year 79, and Pliny on the 24th of August of the same year when Vesuvius erupted, and he just happened to be there. But I digress. Pliny wrote that he had seen a Laocoon group in the house of Titus, and he attributed the group to three Greek sculptors from the island of Rhodes, called Agesander, 
Athenodoros and Polydoros. Now, we don't know anything about these sculptors. And up until relatively recently, this was the only work we knew attributed to them. That is, until 1959, when a large group of sculptors was found in a town called Sperlonga. It's this town roughly halfway between Rome and Naples. This is the site of a villa owned by Tiberius, who had been the son of Augustus and was the second ever Roman emperor. We knew this villa from ancient writers such as Tacitus. And from his writings, we know that there was a grotto, a man-made cave filled with spectacular sculptures. And that grotto apparently collapsed in the year 26. Tiberius was there and he narrowly escaped. And that grotto was finally located in the year 1959. And as I said, there were a lot of spectacular sculptures inside and they were found like this one and they were signed by the same three sculptors, Agassander, Athenodoros and Polydoros. Their names are on the bow of the sculpted ship. And this is very helpful for us in determining when the Laocoon group was made. You see, it's quite difficult to date marble sculptures. You cannot do it with just the material. There's no way to sort of carbon date it or anything. The only thing you have is the style it was made in. And for a long time, art historians differed widely in opinion because the style looks a lot like the style of Pergamon. And Pergamon is this ancient city in modern day Turkey that most people know from the altar that can now be seen in Berlin in the Pergamon Museum. And it has these huge struggling figures on it because it depicts a fight between the gods and the titans. You can see them fighting with all these big, bulging, strong muscles and figures using extreme strength, quite a bit like in the Lao Kong group that we see here. Because we have here a priest that's a pretty fit guy, with a body that would put many a modern athlete to shame. And although stylistically it looks similar, it was only seen in Rome just before the year 79. That means that it could have been made anywhere between the time that Pergamon was made, 3rd century BCE, up until halfway through the 1st century CE, which gives us a span of roughly 300 years. But the find of the sculptures in Sperlonga narrows things down quite a bit. You see, the sculptures that were found there seem to have been made for the location. And that tells us that at least they were made before 26 CE, when the grotto collapsed, but probably not that long before, because this whole villa was built for Tiberius. Now I have to tell you that this is not settled yet. There are art historians that claim that these are simply different people by similar names because the style of the sculptures differ from each other. And perhaps they're right. But I think that these were three sculptors, possibly from Rhodes, as Pliny wrote, who worked on demand for a wealthy Roman audience. And that would put it somewhere between say 20 and 70 CE. And that makes sense with the subject of Laocon as well, as I said earlier. Now, the Laocon group was rediscovered in 1506. So at the height of the Renaissance in Rome, I would say, although art historians tend to call it the high Renaissance by then, but I think that's nitpicking in this case. In Rome, people had been digging up ancient sculptures for over a century by then. At first, with the intent of pulverizing them. You see, when Donatello and Brunelleschi came to Rome in the early 15th century, they witnessed exactly that. Rome had been depopulated over time and had become very poor. It had shrunk to less than 1% of its highest population in ancient Rome. But the Pope had decided to come back to the city and had started to invest in rebuilding part of it. And that's why they needed lots and lots of cement. And apparently, if you pulverize marble and then burn it, you get one of the ingredients for cement. So in the early 15th century, priests saw all of these ancient sculptures as heathen and had them ritually destroyed and then burnt. And honestly, we have no idea how many sculptures were lost. We can only guess that it was a lot. But a few decades later, the Renaissance had really started and people got interested in keeping these sculptures and they became coveted by the wealthiest collectors. And in 1506, by far the wealthiest collector in all of Rome was Pope Julius II. And the story goes that when they were digging in a particular vineyard, they did that because already they knew or suspected that that was the location of the palace of Titus. 
And I guess most artists in town knew about these searches. So at some point they started finding these fragments and suspected that they had found a larger sculptural group. Now you have to imagine that this was not done by careful archaeologists. This was done by people who wanted to sell these sculptures as quickly as possible to the highest bidder. And they thought they had found something, so they sent someone to inform the court of the Pope. And Julius immediately sent these messengers on to his main artist. And those were Giuliano da San Gallo and Michelangelo. Both were from Florence, with da San Gallo being the senior artist, and he was an architect for the Pope. And his house apparently was a place where many of the Florentine artists would gather. But it was Michelangelo that was of the most interest to the Pope, I would say because Michelangelo had been trained not just as a sculptor, but also as an historian. He had spent part of his youth as part of the team of restorers of the collection of antique sculptures in the Medici collection. Nevertheless, the story goes that once they heard there was evidence of a sculptural group that was found there, that Giuliano exclaimed, it must be Laocoon, because all of them had read Pliny, and they were all hoping that this particular sculpture would be found. Now, it was mentioned by Pliny, but nobody knew what it would look like, of course, because they only had this short description that it was this group of a priest and his sons fighting these snakes. And they found them in many different pieces, because several arms had broken off and so had a lot of the parts of the snakes. So it was basically a very big puzzle where they didn't even know if they had all the pieces. And of course, no box to look at to figure out what it was supposed to be when they were done. For instance, one of the sons is somewhat detached from the rest of the group. He was found much later when they had already started restoring the group. It's the one on the right. But they found the group in February of 1506, and by March they thought they'd found everything, and it was sold to Julius II and brought over to the Vatican, where by August it was installed in a niche in the wall of a new pavilion called the Belvedere, and in that very same niche it still stands today. These days that pavilion has become part of the Vatican museums, and you can't really tell, unless you know, that it once was a separate building. It was only removed for a few years when it was stolen by Napoleon. Because if you ever wonder who was the biggest art thief in history, it's Napoleon. And there's really no competition. But after his fall, it was returned to the Vatican. But back in the 16th century, what they had found and brought to the Vatican were just these three figures and the snakes. They weren't actually sitting on anything. Because nowadays you can see Laocon sitting on a block which is often called their altar. But that's not part of the original group. It was added because it made sense and they couldn't be placed upright without it. But it probably wasn't until the 1540s that the current plinth was added. And you can see something like that on this depiction of it from the 1530s made in Urbino. You can see that it doesn't have its seat and plinth yet. But you can also see that Laocon doesn't have a right arm. And that's because they hadn't found it. And it was the cause of some controversy. Because when they assembled all the different pieces, he was left without that arm and various different ideas were proposed as to what that arm would have to look like. Most sculptors at the time agreed that the arm should be extended almost directly straight upwards. And the only dissenting voice was that of Michelangelo, who claimed that the position of the shoulder indicated that the upper arm should point to Laocon's right. And because it wouldn't make sense that he would have an outstretched arm, it made sense that the arm would be bent with his hand somewhere near Laocon's head. But no one listened. Instead, a competition was called for, where various sculptors were asked to make a fitting arm. They all came up with variations on its sticking it straight up. And one was actually made with the intention to fit it to the sculpture, but they never actually placed it there. That's why, even in the 1540s, we can see it without that arm. But there were quite a few copies made, first in plaster, but also in more expensive materials. And there you could, of course, freely add the arm of your choice. That is why we have plenty of depictions of Laocon with his arm in the air. The sons, though, they do have arms. And those were also additions by restorers. Because of these hands, the originals were never found. But then, in 1906, 400 years after the group had been found, an archaeologist by the name of Ludwig Polak had a chance to dig very close to the same spot that the Laocon group had originally been found, because they were going to build there and allowed archaeologists to search there first. And he uncovered this arm. 
which just happens to be exactly in the position that Michelangelo had suggested. He brought it to the Vatican, thinking that they would be delighted to finally have the missing arm, but it stayed in storage for 50 years, until in the late 1950s it was finally looked at seriously. And as it turns out, they fit together pretty well. So well in fact that there are two drill holes, one in the arm and one in the sculpture, that would have been there to place a pin in so you can attach the one to the other. And they align perfectly. So finally in the 1950s they added the arm we now all think belonged to the sculpture from the beginning. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing people for being careful about restorations. I think they did the right thing taking it easy, finding out as much as they could before adding it. But perhaps it did take a bit long to do it. And for those of us who are fans of Michelangelo, it's nice to see that he was vindicated four and a half centuries after his ideas were rejected. Now the Lao Kong group had a huge impact on art. It was one of the first sculptures of the Hellenistic style that appeared in Rome. And it showed that not all ancient sculpture was these idealized serene godly figures. There had also been times that things were not balanced and there were deep emotions and strength that you can see in these sculptures. At a time when everything, Roman or Greek, was seen as the best art ever. And now this opened the eyes of so many artists. For instance, Michelangelo would eventually start making much more expressive poses for his figures and would make them much more muscular as well. And of course, eventually it would influence entire styles that we now call mannerism and later even the Baroque. And of course today you can still see that very same sculpture in the Vatican museums, in the Vatican, in Rome. So whether you are planning a trip there or you're going there right now, this is one of those things you really don't want to miss when in Rome. But before you go, this is that time where I remind you that you should of course hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and to subscribe to my channel. I'm not entirely sure how, but somehow it helps my channel grow and of course if you hit that bell button, then you get notified whenever I post videos. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.